Where are you? Pardon? Where are you? Uh, Melbourne, Australia. Okay. Oh, all right, uh, let's get started. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker uh, today. It's uh, Chloe Papan. So she's now actually no longer at uh, RANS. So she's already at Grenoble. And she's going to tell us something about a whitehead algorithm for generalized bounds like solid arc groups. Chloe, please. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, um, uh, maybe it. Uh, I hope it's it's all right. Maybe it's a bit slow. So tell me if you uh, don't see correctly my screen. Uh, so I'm going to explain to you what uh, generous bounds slack solitaire groups are. So they are the um, they are the groups that I study, and I I study actually uh, many of their properties, and uh, I will. And then I will explain what I mean by white header. So, okay, uh, uh, <laughs> it's not working well. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I uh, your connection is sort of breaking up a bit. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, at least for me, I'm not sure about um, the others. So, uh, uh, so it's possible that something is happening with your internet. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it is breaking it's up. Breaking, yes. I mean, you could uh, you could try, you know. So I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, maybe. Try to just connect oh, and okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's just very slow and. <laughs> Oh, uh, I, um, okay. I hope I can. I wish I could go back to the other to the Zoom to to shut down my my camera. I, I think it's not helping. Um, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, I'm I'm having trouble. Um, saying something to my computer. Okay. Uh, so, videos off, I hope it's better now. Okay. It seems to be responding better. So, um, sorry for the inconvenience. Um, so, First of all, I want to introduce bounce lag solita groups. So bounce lag solita groups are defined by the following presentation, and you have two parameters, PQ, which are uh, which are in which are integers but non-zero. So the presentation is uh, it has two generators and one relation which is T A P T minus one equals AQ. So um, whenever I talked about these groups, about uh, mathematicians, they tell me they are, that, they are, that they give good counterexamples for some property that they study. Uh, so they actually were introduced as example of non hopfian groups. So they're not uh, all non hopfian but BS23 is non hopfian So it means it has um, a subjective morphism into itself, which is not an automorphism. So, more precisely, I study the outer automorphism groups. Uh, so, outer automorphism group is defined as automorphism group uh, quotiented by the inner automorphism group. And so, uh, by changing P and Q, you can you can obtain a wide range of of different groups. For example, BS11 is Z2, so maybe you know the automorphisms. And for example, if you take BS23 and you, you study the outer automorphism group, uh, this is finite. So it's not 
it's not very interesting. But if you change the three into a four, out of PS24 is not finitely generated. So that was uh, to give you uh, an idea of how different they can be. And the, actually, the reason why this is not finitely generated is that the P here divides Q. So an aspect of uh, bounce lock solita groups, which is interesting for, for the talk, is that they, they can be defined as the fundamental group of a graph of groups. So let me explain what a graph of group is. So it's a graph. And on vertices and edges, you have labels, and the labels are groups. And whenever you have an edge, uh, which terminates on a vertex, you have an injection of the edge group uh, into the vertex group, which you have to specify in the graph. So the example for the talk is a graph with one orbit of edge, with one edge and one vertex. And the, the groups, are both, uh, are both uh, Zs. So now I have to specify an injection of, of Z into Z, one, of, one on each side of the graph. So uh, an injection of Z into Z is uh, defined by the multiplication by a non-zero integer. So these will be the P and Q as before. And uh, so this is my graph of group, and BSPQ is what we call uh, the fundamental, fundamental group of the graph of groups. So um, let me give you an idea of what this fundamental group is. It's not the fundamental group in the in the common uh, uh, common exception. That would be Z. So, in order to construct this fundamental group, one thing we can do is uh, take a topological space whose pi one in the, in the usual sense is Z. So this this is a circle. And now take another circle, but taken it, so it's actually a cylinder. So I have a tube and a circle, and the, the tube corresponds to the edge and the circle to the vertex. And now I'm going to glue the tube on the circle. So this end here, I'm going to glue it on the circle here, but um, I will make several turns around the circle. I will wrap it p times. And this here, I will wrap it q times around the circle. So in the end, I get a, um, I get a space, a topological space, um, which is not a torus because it has layers on the side like that. And um, its fundamental group in the usual sense is PSPQ. Um, so I, I remind you the, the presentation. And you can see the generators for BSPQ here. So this is the A and the T is the is this um, this loop. So this is what I mean when I take a graph of groups. Uh, the the group that I associate to this graph is given by this space. So my my title uh, mentioned generalized bounce like solitaire groups. So 
uh, these are similar to van Vlaak solita groups in the sense that they are obtained by taking graphs of groups with uh, cyclic groups everywhere, like this one, for example. This is a graph of group which defines a, a GB, uh, generalized van Vlaak solita group, uh, which you can see as the the fundamental group of uh, something like that, a tube that you glue on two circles, but you make some turns when you when you glue it. So other examples include uh, this graph of groups. So since the since all of the edge and vertex groups are Z, I don't need to mention them everywhere. So I just mentioned the integers. So oh, this one is also interesting. And you can have plenty of other graphs of groups, uh, of cyclic groups. So this one's another example. Okay. Um, so, oh, so here's the place where I wrote when I couldn't find my pointer. Um, so what's, what is the, um, the use of these graphs of groups? Um, so actually the, the use of graphs of groups is that they give nice sections on trees. Or that's the use that I, that I have. So when you take a normal graph, a graph which is not a graph of groups, you can, you can look at its uh, fundamental group in the usual sense and this is this this here when you have a graph with two loops uh, you get the free group on two generators and you can take the universal cover of the of the graph and you have an action uh, you have an action a natural action of the if, if the graph is gamma you have an action of the fundamental group on the on the tree here. And what does the action look like? For example, if I take a generator here of my free group, it acts on the tree by uh, by translating the tree uh, along an axis along an axis. So that's what happens when you take a normal graph, and then um, the action that you obtain. Here is is free. So when you have a graph of groups, you can also associate a, an action, a canonical action of the fundamental group on the tree, and uh, the action has has the following property. So the first one is that the quotient by the action is is the graph gamma. So without the without the groups. Like in the like for a classical universal cover, and the second property. So the action, um, the action cannot be free unless phi one of gamma is a free group. So actually, the the action has non-trivial stabilizers, and they are given by the groups in gamma. So stabilizers are conjugate. To the groups of gamma. So that's our uh, Vassar theory, which gives the the link between graphs of groups and actions on trees. And conversely, if you have an action on a tree, you can you can get the the graph gamma by taking the quotient and the stabilizers. The, the groups of your graph of groups are given by the stabilizers. So, um, what should you uh, what should you keep in mind if you have a GBS group G? So, it means a group that can be seen as the fundamental group of a graph of group with 
cyclic, uh, infinite cyclic groups. So yeah, there's a correspondence between identifications of G with uh, fundamental groups of, of graphs of groups and actions on, of G on, on cyclical trees with uh, cyclic stabilizers. So this is, this is a, an important point. Uh, it means that you can choose to adopt one point of view of the other. And the graphs of groups are nice because they, they are finite. So um, for algorithmic um, purposes, they will be handy. But the trees, are, the actions of trees are, are nice because, uh, you know, they're geometric and they're... Um, they're, they're interesting to study. So I can make a few, a few remarks about that. Um, the first remark is that uh, these, these sets are, are usually big. Um, given, given a graph gamma, uh, there are many possible, there, there can be many automatic automorphisms uh, of G so so you have many uh, you have many choices uh, I mean infinitely many uh, choices for the identification and uh, given given a group G even if you make abstraction of this part you have many possible gammas uh, and by many possible gammas, this, um, how how many depends on G? But uh, for uh, remember uh, BS24 that I had before. So I said uh, I said its graph of groups was uh, this one. But actually, I drew another graph of group which was this one, where K is. Uh, a positive integer and the fundamental group of this graph of group is also BS24. So even a, a GBS group which looks quite simple can have many, infinitely many possible graphs of groups. And actually the, um, there is no uh, general solution to the isomorphism problem. So uh, the, um, so this problem is uh, isomorphism problem uh, given two graphs of groups gamma prime, gamma prime um, the question is are the groups pi 1 of gamma and pi 1 of gamma prime isomorphic and this has no no general solution for generalized perhaps not groups. So um, this whole set of, of identifications of G with a graph of groups, with a fundamental group of graph of groups, uh, it actually can be endowed with the structure. So here's what we call the deformation space associated to a uh, GBS group G. Um, so it's the um, it's the set of minimal actions of G on, on simplicial trees. So there's a metric here. Uh, I can endow the trees with a metric by giving a length for edges. And so I also ask that these actions have um, cyclic edge and vertex stabilizers. And now I I quotient this space this set uh, by homothety and uh, G equivalent isometry, and so it gives me a a space which can which can be identified with a kind of um, a kind of uh, simplicial complex, and so it can be endowed with topologies and one can also define a pseudometric on it. Um, and you have a, 
what is interesting about this space is that you have an action on of the of the group of outer automorphisms. So what is the action? Uh, the comp the um, an automorphism uh, phi in it acts by composition of the actions here. And actually, um, inner automorphisms have a trivial action on D because um, this goes in the G equivalent isometry part. So in G acts trivially. Um, so this space uh, is not completely new because it has uh, strong links with other well-known spaces and groups. Uh, so what's the analogy? So my group here that I want to study is out of G, where G is a GBS group. And it can be likened to out of FN. And that's for the reason that I, I said before, that you, you can see um, FN as the fundamental group of a, group, of a graph. And actually, um, a normal graph is just a graph of groups with uh, trivial groups everywhere. So there's an analogy between these two. And out FN is also analogous to, to mapping class group of a surface. And the, all these groups have the particularity that they act on a nice space. So the, the well-known space on which mapping class group acts is the Teichmüller space. Um, and there's an analog, an analog for FN, which is outer space. So color documents out of space. And here our um, our deformation space D is an analog of outer space. And there are plenty of other spaces that you could uh, construct and some which are interesting is uh, the curve complex. So there's a curve complex that one can define for a mapping class group, and uh, it has a particularity, it is hyperbolic. And you, have, you also have an al several analogs of curve complex on out FN. For example, you have the three factor complex. And this one is also hyperbolic. And you have plenty of other complexes. I won't uh, give a list. So the question is, uh, is there a complex? Is there such a complex for LG? So I don't know. <laughs> um, but one can construct, construct uh, an analog of the free factor complex, which I call the cyclic factor complex. So this hasn't been studied yet, I think. But it's a complex, and I don't know. I don't know. It's it could be a candidate for a hyperbolic space on which out G acts. But I don't know. Actually, um, so I will define what is what cyclic factors are. And um, the rest of the talk would be about finding stuff about cyclic factors. Oops. So uh, here is a reminder. What a, what is a free factor um, when you have a group G and um, you say a, a subgroup A is a free factor? If you can write G as a free product where A is one of the factors, and so I I wanted 
um, in the in the array above, um, I had a three-factor complex uh, for the for Fn. So uh, Fn has three factors. Uh, so maybe I'm stating something obvious here. Um, but what I want to say is that um, given a free factor A of Fn, you can find a graph and an identification of Fn with the, with the pi 1 of the graph such that A is the pi 1 of, the, of a subgraph. I one of the subgraph is A. And uh, Van Kempen theorem tells you that uh, given a uh, pi one of a subgraph, uh, it is a free factor. Um, so in GPS groups, uh, free factors are not relevant. But I would like to do the same. So what I want to do is take a graph of groups and this is a graph of groups, but even if there are no visible groups. And I want to say that the, um, the pi one of this graph, which is also a graph of groups, is a cyclic factor. Uh, so I wrote a definition. No, I haven't written it. So here's the definition. Um, so I say uh, that H, a subgroup of G, is a cyclic factor. If uh, there exists a graph of group gamma with uh, cyclic groups uh, such that um, so such that G is uh, identified with pi one of gamma, and there exists a, sub, a subgraph of gamma such that H identifies with pi one of gamma prime, and the the map here um, should be the same. And I say that the cyclic factor is proper uh, if H is not G. And that is uh, the same as uh, if gamma prime is not gamma. So um, H is not actually so, a cyclic group, right? You know, the word cyclic. No, here. no, right. Uh, so that's what I wanted to, to specify. So when you have a free factor, it usually uh, unless G is free, there's no reason that the why the free factor should be free. Uh, for example, uh, this is a free product and Z2 is a free factor, but it's not free. And here, uh, when I say cyclic factor, uh, so here the free is the star here. And when I say a cyclic factor, uh, what you can have in mind is an amalgamated product, A, star B above Z. And that, that is where there is a, a cyclic. The, um, actually, my, um, my cyclic factor will, will never be a cyclic group. Um, in, in the context of GBS groups, um, cyclic groups are sort of the analog of, of the trivial group in a free group. So that's about uh, cyclic factors. So now I want to introduce Whitehead as what Whitehead's algorithms. So I know I know about two Whitehead algorithms. The first one, so there are algorithms for the free group uh, at the beginning. So the first one is an algorithm which takes an element G of the free group Fn 
and which decides whether the, there exists a free factor which contains G. And the second one that I know of is an algorithm which takes two elements G and H and which decides that whether they belong to the same OTFN orbit. So if there is an automorphism which uh, sends one to the other. And um, in the case of the free group, both algorithms can be, can be solved with a similar approach with uh, consists in using a generating set for out fn, for out fn, um, a finite generating set, and it consists in um, changing g or g and h step by step by applying automorphisms until you until you obtain an answer, and but I said that uh, out of uh, BS24 is not finitely generated, so uh, this approach does not uh, does not work um, with uh, with GBS group in general. And so the first algorithm I can I can find uh, an analogous for Banflax solita groups and generalized Banflax solita groups, but the second uh, I don't know. It's an open question. So here's the, the theorem. The main theorem uh, is that there is an algorithm which takes uh, a group G. So a GBS group. So uh, have in mind that it takes it as a graph of group and it takes an element G of the group G and I demand that the, the element G be loxodromic and I will explain what I mean and so it takes this element G and uh, decides whether there exists a free factor uh, which contains G. Not a free factor, sorry. Uh, uh, so now it's a cyclic factor, not free factor. Which contains G. So um, what's a loxodromic element? Uh, usually loxodromic uh, refers to a particular action. So if you have an action of G on a tree T uh, and an element of G, you say that G is loxodromic um, if, um, if the, the stable translation length um, so is um, is greater than zero. Uh, so in a tree, in the particular context of a tree, it means that G fixes no point in the tree, and it it translates the tree along an axis. And the point here is that uh, this does not depend on the choice of T in the deformation space. on the choice of T in D. And well, there are, there are a few exceptions. There are two exceptions. Um, so the two exceptions are if G is Z2, so Z2 is BS11. So it's a, it's a Bansak solita group, but it's not, uh, it's not a normal one. And uh, you also have uh, the exception, uh, which is the client, the pi one of the client bottle, which is um, which is BS one minus one. So the property that uh, 
G is log to the mix does depend on the choice of T for these two cases. But in the rest of the cases, it does not depend. And it's not, it's not an obvious fact. Um, but, uh, yeah. So here's for the explanation of the, the underlying term here. So now uh, let us look at the theorem and what can we, what uh, can we do if we have a, a GBS group as a graph of groups like, like that. So I don't know the, the groups, but this is a graph of groups gamma and um, I want to, to I want to understand the element G in the graph of groups so what I can do is I take the the universal cover so it's a tree like that and so I said that G is loxodromic so it has an axis in the tree and and now I can I can take the quotient of the tree and I go back to the graph of groups and I can see my axis in this graph here and the axis is a loop in the graph and maybe it does something like that it can make it can make um, U turns and maybe it looks like that here's an example of a loop. And here you can you can see that the the loop does not take all the graph. It does not cross all the graph. So actually, you can define a free factor by taking this subgraph here, gamma prime. And uh, here you obtain that G belongs to the fundamental group of gamma prime, which is a free factor. Of, uh, of the of the pi one of the whole graph, it's a cyclic factor. Sorry. So um, this case is nice. Actually, um, if I take if I take uh, G in general, I won't have I won't have this case. Maybe G will take all the space, and uh, yet it could still be it could still belong to a cyclic factor. Think of uh, Think of the case of a free group, for example. Uh, so if you have a, a free group, uh, for example, F3 with two gen three generators, uh, for example, you can write it uh, as a decomposition in a free product that way. So for example, G equals ABC. And then when you, when you look at the graph with the canonical fundamental group, the, the element G uh, crosses all the edges in the graph while it's in a free factor. So the case here is the ideal case, but we don't have this uh, all the time. And uh, the aim of the proof of the algorithm is that we will try to we will start with a with an element G and try to put its axis in a subgraph of the graph. So in the case of three groups, the classical approach for whitehead algorithm also consists in putting the axis in a in a part of the graph. But the the method is different here because instead of uh, transforming the element, we will transform the graph and keep the same G. So I will do, uh, now I will do an example. <laughs> Concrete example. So here's my favorite bounce lux solita group, PS24, with, uh, with its presentation. And here is the, the usual graph of groups. And now I want to construct the universal cover. So what is the universal cover? So I have 
one vertex and one edge in my graph of groups. So I should have one orbit of vertices and one orbit of edges in the, in the universal cover. So here's a vertex. And I put an arrow on the edge. So from my vertex here, there is there are, um, there are edges uh, which which leave the vertex on the right and edges with uh, edges on the left which enter the vertex. So I should have edges on that side and on that side. And now the the numbers here four and two they describe the index of the edge stabilizer into the the vertex stabilizer. So here I should have four edges leaving and two edges entering. And as I have only one orbit of vertex, I see the same picture at every vertex. So it should look like that, etc. So how does my group act on the tree? Um, so the the element A should be should fix a vertex here, and actually it generates the stabilizer of one vertex. And T T is an element which is loxodromic, and it has an axis which goes through the green vertex, and it it translates the three by one edge. And now, um, who is my my g, my small g? So I take the commutator t a t minus one a minus one, and now let's construct its axis. So I won't I won't give uh, a very uh, good proof of that, but uh, the intuition is that t when you have t in the the word here that means you should you should go forward by one edge so start at the green vertex and go forward by one edge and when you have a you should turn but stay at the same place and when when you have t minus one you should go backwards but you have turned so you go to this vertex and you have a minus one so you turn again and you you do some zigzag like that. So this is what my axis look, looks like. So I can take the, the quotient. And so here's my my quotient graph. So the, the axis should leave the vertex here and go around the edge. But when it arrives here, it makes a U-turn. It goes backward and goes back here and makes a U-turn and we close the loop. So we see that uh, that it's not in a subgraph, obviously, because there is one orbit of edge. Uh, it couldn't be in a subgraph. Um, but it's not a proof that it's not free. It's not a, in a cyclic. Um, Factor. So now we'll we'll try to change the graph. Uh, let's have a closer look at the vertex V here. So there are two edges on the left and four on the right, and there is this red axis which comes here and goes back this way. This is vertex V, and. So um, I would like to see what happens at every vertex of the tree, but um, it's easier to study one single vertex. So uh, what is uh, what is uh, coherent now is to to look at the translates of this red axis in the tree, and the translates of the red axis correspond to conjugates of G. So uh, you can, you have a translate of the red axis which does that, and another one which does that, that, or even that. But there's a, a common point 
to all these axes. I can draw a line, a fictive line uh, in blue, and none of the axes um, crosses the line. So if an axis comes from the left, it will leave in the, on the left. And same thing for the right. So here's something I can do. I can replace the vertex V by an edge. An edge E. So here's an edge E. And I attach, um, I attach the edges here on each side of E. So two on the left and four on the right. And all my axes lift in this picture. The red axis here, and we have orange axis uh, like that. And you can see that none of the axes cross the edge E. So now I want to, I want to do the same thing as at, um, at every vertex in the tree so that the action extends. So I obtain something like that. I will try to to draw a small picture. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so it has two orbits of edges, one orange and one blue. Yeah, we'll draw another part here. Um, up. And in fact, the action uh, the action lifts to this tree, and my axes also lift in this tree, and the axis of of G is uh, something which goes like that. A zigzag, but it does not, it never crosses the orange edges. So the orange edges correspond to E here. So now I can take the quotient of this graph. So my quotient is, is still a circle, but a circle with two edges a blue edge and an orange edge. And my numbers are these. Four. And when I look at my red axis, the axis of G in the quotient, so this is G, uh, the axis leaves from here and goes around the blue edge and makes a U-turn, goes backwards and closes the loop. And now uh, you can see that the axis is in a strict subgraph. So G belongs to, G belongs to a cyclic factor. And the cyclic factor is a GBS group, which can be defined by the graph of group like that. So, uh, if you if you understand this example, actually, uh, it's about all what happens. So, not exactly, uh, but uh, a good part. So, so we saw that um, looking at the vertices was useful information to to modify the tree and there's a tool for that which is called whitehead graphs so whitehead graphs have nothing to do with graphs of groups they are they are a different kind of graph uh, so if you take g um, some t in the deformation space and some v the vertex in t uh, the whitehead graph in t for g at vertex v is a graph with uh, vertices and its vertices are uh, there are edges of T with origin V and its edges so its edges there's an edge between uh, E and E prime which are edges of T if um, the axe the axe of uh, conjugate of G crosses both edges. So let's see an example. So we have a, 
uh, an example near the ready above. So at vertex V here, I can construct the whitehead graph. It has six vertices, two on the left and four on the right. And I can link the edges which are crossed by one axis. So these ones, talk, talk, up. And I obtain this graph. And you can see that it's disconnected. And this is the property that we use to, to, to expand the tree. So now I will give you two, two results about whitehead graphs. The first is a lemma, which says that, uh, so takes T in D. So the following are equivalent. The first uh, A, uh, there exists V, a vertex in T, such that the whitehead graph at V is either disconnected or has a cut vertex. And a cut vertex is just um, a vertex of the graph, such that if you remove it, then the graph becomes disconnected. And the second is there is a tree in D and uh, a non-injective morphism from S to T, such that the translation length of G in S is the same as in T. And by translation length, I mean combinatorial, the number of edges in the fundamental domain for G. So what, what this says is that um, when I have a tree and I see a, a whitehead graph in the tree which is disconnected or has a cut vertex, I can do, um, I can modify the tree just as we did before in the example. I can modify the tree and I have this condition on the axis of G. So the the map here uh, from s to t is isometric on the axis of t so i can modify the tree but outside of the axis of g and so this gives me a key to modify the tree but um i know how to stop when um i i know uh something what that can happen is that Finally, I find a tree in which the axis of G is in a subgraph. And if it does not happen, uh, I need to know when I'm done and the, and the element G is not in a cyclic factor. And this is given by the result here. So if there exists a T in D such that A fails, then uh, G is not is not in a in a cyclic factor. So this is a criterion which tells me when to stop. So now I can I can give you a sketch of the algorithm. Um, yeah. Uh, Good if you can still see that. So, um, maybe I can make that higher. Um, so, here's the idea of the algorithm. I start with the graph of group, and uh, remember, graph of group is the same information as the tree. So, I can say graph of group and and mean tree and and also mean, uh, say tree and mean a graph of group. I have the same information in both. So in my graph of groups, I compute the axis of G and I have two possibilities. Maybe uh, it is in a subgraph. So 
if it's the case, then G is in a free factor, in a cyclic factor. So this is a yes. And if it's not in a subgraph, I can compute the whitehead graphs. Whitehead graphs. So now I have this criterion above. So either the, um, the A here fails, A fails, which means I find, um, I don't find, I can't find a whitehead graph which is disconnected or with cut vertex. And in that case, G is not in the cyclic factor. And if A, uh, if A is true, then uh, I construct a tree, a new tree, uh, T and plus one. Um, and the map from Tn plus one uh, to Tn, um, such that the translation length is still the same. But now I can repeat the operations with this new tree. And uh, so this eventually stops. Uh, so, so I say a theorem that is, uh, it's not a full, a full statement. So this terminates. What's the reason for for which it it terminates? Um, actually, uh, the the co volume of T n plus one, uh, the, the co volume of T n is increasing. Um, so, however, there there's a small shade, to the picture. Um, here, um, it's only uh, greater or equal to the co volume of T n. But it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, so the reason why there's a possible inequality, the possible equality is that um, there are there are edge stabilizers, and they they are the reason why I can have this problem here. But um, also I have uh, something nice uh, if if equality. If I have an equality, then I have a complexity, which I won't explain, which decreases. And why is it good that the volume uh, increases? So if you keep doing that indefinitely, you will end up having an arbitrary big co-volume. Uh, so if the co-volume of Tn is greater, strictly greater than the translation length of G in Tn, but this is this does not depend on N, then uh, G cannot, uh, G has to be in a subgraph. Because it can't cross all of its sub edges. So eventually, this proves that eventually the, the algorithm stops. Um, so I see I'm nearly out of time. So um, now the last thing I want to say is that uh, you can keep doing that. So given a, a group G and an element in it, we, we may have found with the algorithm, we find um, a cyclic factor such that G is an H and H is also a general bounds like solitary group. So you can do you can do the algorithm again with with the group H, and you, maybe you will find a smaller cyclic factor which contains G. And uh, there's a there's something nice on on cyclic factors. You have a decreasing chain condition. So if you take a decreasing sequence of uh, of cyclic factors. then 
this uh, this sequence has to be stationary. And um, so observe that if we had a free group, um, if you know well about free groups, uh, you know that when you take a free factor of free group, the rank of the free factor is strictly smaller than the rank of the total group. So the, the rank of the group bounds the length of every decreasing sequence of free, of free factors of free groups. And here, um, for GPS groups, we don't have uh, the, the rank uh, understood as the minimal number of generators does not, um, it must not, it does not have to decrease. But there is a complexity which decreases. And the complexity is, uh, is in an N3 and it's for lexicographic order. And a fact worth mentioning is that there is, uh, in general, for example, in BS24, there is no bound on the length of dec decreasing sequences. You could have a very long decreasing sequence before you before you find the, the cyclic factor, the smallest cyclic factor. And from that, I deduce a theorem. This which is that uh, when I take an element G in a, in a group G, uh, so if G is loxodromic, if it, if it is elliptic, it's another case. So if it is loxodromic, there exists a unique minimal cyclic factor which contains G. And so uh, this is proven by uh, the decreasing chain condition plus the, the fact that uh, cyclic factors are stable by intersection. So now the final corollary is that one can compute the, the minimal cyclic factor. Uh, cyclic factor and that is just by applying the the algorithm before you applying you apply it several times until you you can't find a smaller cyclic factor. Okay, so um, I'm done now. So thank you for for listening. All right, thank you very much. Anyway, Chloe, we lost your, your video again. So yeah, you only see a slide. Yeah, I, I switched it off because uh, it made my, my computer almost freeze. Ah, I see. Uh, okay. So I can All turn right. it on again. Uh, so if there are any questions for Chloe, so uh, you're welcome to ask them now. So. I actually had a few questions. Uh, um, so uh, about uh, the complexity of these uh, algorithms, do you, can you say anything at all? You know, so for example, this domain algorithm for deciding whether or not an element uh, 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 of a GBS group belongs to a cyclic factor, can you- I, I haven't studied the complexity, so I so, haven't studied the question yet and I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, no, I have. I mean, it's a good question, but I haven't studied it yet. Okay. And in the very beginning, I forgot you said something about uh, some kind of a version of the um, uh, of the curve complex of a free factor complex. So, what was it uh, uh, in this case? What was the candidate that you had uh, um, for the free factor? Uh, so, it would be a complex of cyclic factors, um, and. Um, when when two cyclic factors can be seen in the same graph in the same graph of groups, you put an edge between them. Uh, maybe I should write. I don't know. Uh, just a second. Uh, uh, so sorry. When are they connected by an edge? Oh, when? Uh, uh, oh, when they come from I, the same I, from the I same speed. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Uh, like if you have a graph of groups like that. 
And you see two factors. So this is a cyclic factor, and this one's another. So this one is B, and the red one is A. So you put an edge between both factors because they appear in the same in the same graph of groups. So uh, well, I th think it's a good definition for uh, for the complex, but maybe maybe it's not a good definition. I don't know because I don't know the I don't know many properties of the complex yet. Uh, and uh, I forgot what's uh, what's the story with the other the morphism group of um, of this group. So is it understood when it's infinite or was it's finite? Uh, um, sort of. Um, so there are conditions uh, on labels of graphs of groups. Um, there are conditions. There are several classes that you can make. And for example, when you see BS23, uh, you know that uh, its outer automorphism group will be finite because the labels do not divide each other. Uh, uh, and right. uh, 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 there's yeah. a condition. Yeah, yeah I understood that. But, but if you have an arbitrary <laughs> GBS group, you know, can, can you tell there? Uh, what? Sorry? So, just for a totally arbitrary GBS group. So, if you have an arbitrary graph, uh, you know, and an arbitrary assignment. Of, uh, 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 of yes, I, I don't know. I know some sources of a complication. If you have a subgraph which is which has that shape, so. A loop with one side one and the other side n, like in BS24, you know, there is this graph of groups. It has the famous loop. Yeah. So this is called ascending loop. And I think this always makes the automorphism group uh, not finitely generated. Or maybe not always, but it's a, a good cause of, um, of uh, complexity of the groups. So if I want to make a complicated GPS group, I will add these loops to it. Uh, no, I, I was just wondering whether or not, uh, because uh, I don't know, I assume that in the case when uh, it's probably the case, maybe not, you know, that when the uh, outer automorphism group is finite, uh, I would assume that uh, th this complex that you suggest will probably be sort of um, finite or have finite diameter or something, right? Is this correct? Uh, yes, yeah, th uh, I think it is correct. Yeah. For, for BS23, it has okay. sort of one point, yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. For B23, it's one point, and right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I think that when it is finitely generated, the, the deformation space, the, the action of um, the outer automorphism group on the deformation space is co-compact. Hmm. So that's not true for all, all deformation spaces. Okay. Uh, I sorry, I can't I can't hear you. I I think you're talking, but I can't hear you. Uh, no, no, I wasn't. Um, are there any other questions? All right, let us thank Chloe again. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now.